here we go this is the final exam review this is from chapters a b 1 2 3 4 where we talk about motion in one dimension motion in two dimensions vectors stuff like that so this is the first question that you have an object is moving with constant non-zero acceleration that means it has an acceleration right it has an acceleration and it's moving in the positive x direction so isn't this one dimensional motion yes. yeah and you are asked to draw the position versus time position versus time so which means time is always taken on the x-axis and position is on the y-axis and because this is an accelerating object it's not going to be a straight line position time is going to be curved why because the slope of the position time gives you the velocity slope of position time gives you velocity so the slope has to be increasing correct because the velocity is increasing isn't it accelerating so the velocity is increasing so the slope has to be increasing so slope of a position time graph gives you velocity and the slope has to be increasing so I went ahead and said let me add some more questions to this and I said, how would the velocity time graph look like of the same ob object? If it's an accelerating object, how would the velocity time graph look like? Again, time is going to be on the x-axis, velocity on the y-axis, but this time it's going to be a straight line. Assuming that it started from rest, right? It started from rest because at t is equal to zero, velocity is zero. Now, is the slope constant or changing? It's constant, and the slope gives you the acceleration. So the slope of position time graph gives you velocity, but the slope of velocity time graph gives you acceleration. And in this case, the acceleration is constant. Or the slope is constant. So I said, um, Going on to the third one, can you draw the acceleration time graph of the same object? How is the acceleration? Constant. Constant. So you know how the acceleration, yep. The, how the acceleration time graph should look like? It should look like that. Because the acceleration is a constant. And then I went ahead and said, hey, if you find the area of this graph, what are you going to get? What does the area of the acceleration time graph give? Remember, the ex, uh, area is always the product of the two. So what is the product AT? Uh, it's not velocity, but you're very close. Final, uh, no? Huh? Final, uh, it's, it's related to velocity. It's, it's final minus initial. It's the change yeah, in velocity. Now, how do I say that? Because of the equation, which I'm going to just show you. So, area of acceleration time graph gives you change in velocity because, you see, you have this equation. Do you? Do you remember this equation? Let's go back a little bit. Do you remember that equation? Isn't that the change in velocity? And what is the change in velocity? It's A times T. So that led me to think again and said, hey, what would the area of the velocity time graph give you? What does the area of the velocity time graph give you? What is the product of velocity and time? Displacement. Displacement. Yeah, right. So that area would give you the displacement. So the area of the velocity time graph gives you displacement. Well, the area of the position time graph does not give you anything in particular, so don't worry about that. Here's number two. A girl throws a rock horizontally, and that's the most important word in that problem. If anything is thrown horizontally, its initial vertical velocity is zero. That's very important. You've got to write that down. If you see that word horizontally, its initial vertical velocity is zero. And so the horizontal velocity is 10 meter per second. What is the vertical velocity? 
What is the vertical velocity? Zero. Zero. What is the vertical acceleration? Negative 9.8 meter per second squared. So if you think only about the vertical quantities, well, that's a bridge and all that. You know, I had some extra time, so. <laughs> so 20 meter and all that, you know, you see that. So the vertical, initial vertical velocity, that's why I call VOY is zero. A is minus 9.8 meter per second squared. And the vertical displacement is negative 20 because it's going down, right? Negative 20. And you can find the time. How do you find the time? You use this equation. Y is V naught T plus 1 half A T squared. Plug those numbers in. And if you're careful, you will get the time. A half times negative 9.8 is negative 4.9. And so when you do it, you will get the time as two seconds. So what do you got? Time is two seconds. So that was, you were focusing on the vertical motion, right? Now let's think about the horizontal motion. What do you know about the horizontal velocity? It is a constant, it never changes. Gravitational acceleration has no effect on that, okay? So if the velocity is a constant, then the only formula that you have is displacement is velocity multiplied by time. So you would use that. So x is equal to v naught x multiplied by time, which gives you 10 times 2, 20 meter. Here is the question. It says you drive 6 kilometers at 50 kilometer per hour and then another 6 kilometers at 90 kilometer per hour. Your average speed over the 12 kilometer drive will be. Usually when you're given two numbers in math, you know that you take the average by adding them and then divide by two, right? You cannot do that here. The reason is the first six kilometers is being driven at a slow speed. That means the person is going to take a longer time there. And here, it's going to take a smaller time, right? So you cannot give equal credit to those velocities. That's why you cannot take the average like you usually do. So what you have to remember is the formula for average speed. What's the formula for average speed? Total distance divided by total time. So that's all you do. You know the total distance already, right? But you do not know the time. So find the time in each case, add them up. How do you find the time in each case? I've even drawn a diagram there, as you can see first six kilometers, the second six kilometers, and then what would be the time in the first case? Wouldn't the time be, time is distance by velocity, right? Distance by speed. So the first time would be six divided by 50. And of course you will get it in hours. Don't even, don't try to change it into minutes and seconds here, please. And then do the same for the second time, which gives, you 6 divided by 90, which is a smaller time, you get it as 0 0.067 hours. So the total time is the sum of the two. And then you know that the, the total distance is 12 kilometers, right? So you divide 12 by the total time, and you would get the speed as 64.17 kilometer per hour. Now in that question, you really need not calculate because it's just telling you, will it be more than 70, less than 70, right? It's a conceptual question. You need not actually calculate, but I was using that to show you how you could calculate. In that question, you know that this person was driving for a longer time at which speed? For a longer time at 50. So the, the average should be closer to 50. You know what I mean? Than 70. So that's how you do that. It's a conceptual question. So I'm going to do four and five together. So number four, you, you have to change 199 kilograms into milligrams. What do you mean by the word kilo? 
thousand, thousand. Gram. so one kilogram is a thousand grams and then one gram is a thousand milligrams because the word milli means one by thousand you see so that's what you remember one kilogram is a that's 10 to the power 3 which is thousand grams and one gram is 10 to the power 3 milligram which means one kilogram is 10 to the power 6 milligram so you multiply that with 10 to the power 6 it's always better to leave it like that instead of adding zeros and that is 1.99 times 10 to the 8 isn't it so 1.99 times 10 to the 8 so that's the answer your motorboat can move at 30 kilometers per hour in still water what is the minimum time it will take you to move 12 kilometers downstream in a river flowing at 6 kilometers per hour if you want to get the shortest time if you're going downstream what would be the resultant velocity because the boat can move at 30 and the water is flowing at 6 and both are moving the same direction right that's why it's 36 what if it was in the opposite it would be 24 if it's upstream oh. if it's upstream it will be 24 if it's downstream it's going to be 36 and i also took another case you will see that so this case it's downstream so that it is uh, those are the two vectors simply add them up you get the total and time is nothing but distance of displacement divided by velocity right so you would get the answer you're going to get it in hours and once you get it in hours multiply it with 60 to get it into minutes so i use that as a launch pad what if the boat was moving like this so the water is flowing at six kilometer per hour and the boat is moving straight across at least that's the intention so the boat starts from here and wants to go straight to the other shore okay you know that it will not reach here instead it'll reach here correct so now can you find the time it takes to cross that river it's not going upstream or downstream now it's crossing the river can you find the time it takes to cross the river that's my question now can you yes i'm going to give you the the width of the river yes. then you can so what do you do you don't have to find the resultant you keep the horizontal and the vertical separate so with the distance across and you know the speed at which it was going what you do is divide no no i'm going to show you okay. okay so i assume that the width of the river was three kilometers okay and that is a vertical here right isn't that a vertical displacement what is the vertical velocity 30 so all you got to do is divide 3 by 30 that's all and you will get the time because time is displacement by velocity isn't it okay so that's what I'm doing I know it's written down below 3 kilometers divided by 30 gives you 0 0.1 hours and then I'm I'm also going to ask you can you find this distance like how much did it move horizontally how much did it move horizontally? Six, six uh, times. Six multiply times. The speed. Multiply the six with the point one. Because displacement is velocity multiplied by time, isn't it? Six is not for the river. Six is for the river. So I'm going to use that now. Watch, A B. That's a horizontal displacement, isn't it? So multiply the horizontal velocity with the time. And that will give you the horizontal displacement. Done. Okay, and number six is a very important concept that we have talked about. For general projectile motion with no air resistance, the horizontal component always remains a constant. The horizontal velocity always remains non-zero constant. Why did we have to say that? Because the vertical initial velocity may be 
zero, right? But the horizontal is always going to be non-zero unless the person drops the object. If you drop an object, then what is the initial vertical? Zero. What's the initial horizontal? Zero. Then that becomes one-dimensional motion. It's not two-dimensional anymore. Okay, so here the question is about acceleration. Therefore, the horizontal acceleration is always zero, which means the horizontal velocity is a constant. Now, for this one, I just drew a very important diagram just to show you what I was talking about. You know, I went back and said, okay, this is a very important concept. Do you see the horizontal velocities are the same? This is for a projectile that's thrown vertically up. You see that the initial vertical velocity is bigger, it's getting smaller. Actually, here it should become, you know, the arrows don't show the magnitude. Actually, this should be smaller than, and here it should be how much? It should be zero. So that's not technically correct, but at least the directions are right. For the vertical velocity, changes direction. So that's what I was showing, and I wrote it down. Because it's so important, horizontal acceleration is zero because the horizontal velocity is a constant, right? What's the vertical acceleration? Uh, always negative 9.8 meter per second squared. Always. Whether it's going up or whether it's going down, vertical acceleration is always negative 9.8 meter per second squared because the gravitational force is down, right? So that was question number six. Now we go on to question number seven. Here, the vector A has a magnitude nine meter and points east. That is vector A. Vector B has a magnitude of 7 meter and points north. So that's vector B. And then you have C. Because C has a magnitude of 6 meter and points west. You see that the, I've adjusted the magnitudes also approximately. Do you see that this is bigger than this slightly and this is 6? So for a physics problem, a very important thing for you to do is to draw a diagram. Not only for this problem, for every problem, try to draw a diagram. Without a diagram, you're not going to visualize and you're not going to think. And I see, because I look at the work that you have done, some people try to do these without diagrams. You can't. I can't do it. When you draw the diagram, it becomes very obvious that nine is exactly opposite to six, isn't it? And so what I did is, you first take the resultant of 9 and 6, would be 3, right? In which direction? Towards the east. Yeah, positive x, or towards the east. And so now what you have to do is, because you got the resultant of these two, which is this one, now you take the resultant of this one with the 7. And for that, yep, complete the diagram. That is 3, that is 7, and that is your resultant. Isn't this the resultant? Okay. And don't you know how to find that? Don't you know how to find the magnitude of this? Just square this, square this, add them, take the square root, right? Exactly. How do you find the angle? How do you find the angle? Tan theta is equal to 7 by 3. 7 divided by 3 because tangent is opposite side by adjacent. And that's how you find the angle. So AC is square root of 3 squared plus 7 squared, which gives you root of 58, 7.6 meter, and uh, tan theta is 7 by 3. And uh, you take the inverse of that, you get 66.8. Now, the next thing is you have to know that this is north of east. Because if the vector was here, you're rotating it in this direction, aren't you? Isn't that the east direction? This is your resultant, correct? This is your east. And your resultant is rotated. In what direction are you rotating it? To the north. From the east to the north. So that's what you mean by saying north of east. So the first one shows what direction you moved. 
second one shows from where you moved. So when it says north of east, you started from east and moved to the north. So if it was south of east, it would have been from the east to the south. So north of east, south of east. East of north. East of north would be different. A car initially traveling at 60 km per hour accelerates at a constant rate of 2 m per second squared. How much time is required for the car to reach a speed of 90 km per hour? So the first thing that you have to remember is that you have to change km per hour into m per second. Now the easiest way to do that is to multiply by 5 divided by 18, which is the simplification of multiplying by 1,000 dividing by 3,600, okay, which I have told you. So V0 in this case is 60 km per hour, which is 60 times 5 by 18, 16.67 meter per second. The acceleration is given as 2 meter per second squared. And then the final speed is 90. So 90 times 5 divided by 18 will give you 25 meter per second. And then when you look at that, all right, I'm just showing you how to change kilometer per hour into meter per second, okay? Times 5 by 18. You know that the equation that you use is? Yeah, so that is Vf minus V0 by T. Isn't that the definition of acceleration actually? Yes, acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity by time. So that is the definition of acceleration. Plug in the numbers and you will get the answer as 4.2 seconds. Number nine, to determine the height of a bridge above the water, a person drops a stone. When you see the word drop, you know that the initial velocity is zero. zero and measures the time it takes for it to hit the water. The height of the bridge is 41 meter. How long will it take? Okay, that's a very simple question. V not y is zero. It's the vertical direction in which it's moving. A is negative 9.8, right? Y is the displacement which is 41 meter when you write this you know you have to use this equation y is equal to v naught t plus one half a t squared substitute into that the first term became zero right that's why you don't have it there because this is zero this whole term became zero then you get the answer is 2.9 seconds and that's about the time i took to do this problem 2.9 seconds Okay, so the question says an athlete competing in the long jump leaves the ground with a speed of 9.14 meter per second at an angle of, how much is that? 55 degrees with the vertical. What is the length of the athlete's jump? Now, here is the question. Are you being asked to find the vertical displacement or the horizontal displacement? And what do you know about the horizontal velocity? If the velocity is constant, there's only one equation you can use, which is multiply that velocity with the time. So first you have to find the time. And then once you get the... All right, on question 10, this athlete is competing in the long jump, leaves the ground with a speed of 9.14 meter per second at an angle of 55 degrees with the vertical. You see, the angle is given with the vertical. So, if this angle is 55, then this angle is 35. Therefore, the horizontal component is 9.14 cosine 35, which is 7.48 meter per second. And the vertical component is 9.14 sine 35, which is 5.24 meter per second. Now, using the vertical quantities, we can calculate uh, the time that it takes for the athlete to go from this point to this point. And now for that, we have the vertical velocity as 5.24 meter per second. We know the acceleration is a negative 9.8 
meter per second squared, we can find the time. And we also know that the total vertical displacement is zero. So using this equation, uh, we can plug in the values here and calculate the time to be 1.1 seconds. Once you get the time to be 1.1 seconds, knowing that the horizontal component is a constant, we can find the displacement simply by multiplying that horizontal component by the time, uh, which is... Okay, um, there was a mistake there. The horizontal is 7.48, so 7.48 times 1.1 gives 8.0 meters. So that is the answer. And this is a very important question. In the next question, on a calm day with no wind, you can run a 1500 meter race at a velocity of four meter per second. If you run the same race on a day when you have a constant headwind, that slows your speed by 2.0, how much time would you take to finish the race? Now, since the, the wind is blowing opposite to the runner, the resultant speed is going to be four minus two, which would be two meter per second. So since the resultant speed is two meter per second and it's a 1500 meter race, to find the time, divide 1500 by two, because time is distance by speed. And that gives 750 seconds to complete the race. In this next question, an object is moving in a straight line with a constant acceleration. Initially, it's traveling at 14 meter per second. Two seconds later, it is traveling at 10 meter per second. How far does it move during this time? So in this case, we have the initial velocity as 14 meter per second. We have the time, we have the final velocity. We're asked to find displacement. Pretty straightforward question. These are the quantities given. Initial velocity, 14 meter per second. The final velocity is 10 meter per second. Time is two seconds and we are asked to find the displacement. So the relation that connects these quantities is delta x is equal to v naught plus vf by two multiplied by time, which means the average velocity multiplied by time gives you displacement, right? The average velocity. So, when you put in the numbers and calculate, you get 24 meter. And that is the answer. Here's uh, question number 13. And here you have, was that? Uh, it's a laser thrown upward with a speed of 11 meter per second on the surface of planet X, where the acceleration due to gravity is 5.5, uh, is it? Meter per second squared. What is the maximum height reached by the laser? So what do we have? We have the initial speed. We have the acceleration due to gravity. And you're asked to find the maximum height. The important point here is that at the maximum height, the final velocity is zero. So knowing that the final velocity is zero, we can use the appropriate relation in kinematics uh, to solve this problem. So that's the initial velocity along the y-axis. That's why it's VOY. The acceleration is negative 5.5 meter per second squared. We are asked to find the maximum height and the final velocity at the maximum height is zero. So the relation that connects these quantities is V F squared is equal to V naught squared plus two A delta Y. 
Okay, so put in the numbers there. The square root of 11 is 121 and, and put it in there. This becomes a negative because this is a negative quantity. And so now rearrange that uh, and calculate. You get delta y is equal to 121 by 11, which is going to be 11 meters. And that is how this problem is solved. So since uh, the answer must have the smallest number of decimal places and uh, this one has no decimal place, it's going to be 1133 because it should not have any decimal place. And then question uh, 15, a projectile is fired at an angle above the horizontal at a location where G is 9.8 meter per second squared. The initial X and Y components of its velocity are given at what angle was the projectile fired? So you have the x component and the y component of the velocity. And we're asked to find the angle. All right, so VOX, which is the x component, is 86.6. .6, and VOY, which is the y component, is 50 meter per second. So when you make that vector diagram, you get that. That's 86.6. .6. And then this is 50 meter per second. So this is the angle that you have to find and from this diagram tan theta is opposite side by adjacent side. So tan theta is 50 divided by 86.6 which turns out to be 0 0.5773 and when you take the inverse tan of that you get the angle to be 33.33 degrees. Which when considering significant figures would be 30 degrees, okay. And here's a question, question number 16, which says a motorist travels for three hours at 80 kilometer per hour and for two hours at 100 km per hour. What's the average speed for the trip? Normally in math, when you take the average of two numbers, you add them and divide them by two, but you cannot do that here because the formula for average speed is total distance divided by total time. So we got to figure out the distance traveled uh, during that time of three hours, which would be 80 multiplied by three. And then again, the distance traveled during the two hours would be 100 multiplied by two. So when you add those two, you get the total distance. And you know that the total time is five hours. So that's how that problem is done. Again, the average speed is total distance by total time. Okay, so when we find the total distance, got to multiply 80 km per hour with 3, because speed multiplied by time gives you distance, then add that to 100 multiplied by 2, that would give you the total distance. Alright, I'm just... Uh, showing how we get the units. So that is 240 plus 200, which gives 440 kilometers, which is the total distance. And the total time is five hours. So speed that up. So total time is five hours. Divide the 440 divided by 5, which is going to give 88 kilometers per hour, which is the average speed. And in question 17, 
Again, uh, it's about significant figures and when you divide two numbers, you always go, the answer is going to have this smaller number of significant figures, which is obviously in this one, it has two significant figures. So the answer should have two significant figures. Pretty simple. So divide those two numbers and that's what you get. But this has three significant figures. This has two. The answer should have the lower number of significant figures, which is two. So the answer is rounded off to 0 0.91. Which brings us to question 18. A ball is thrown straight up with a speed of 36 meter per second. How long does it take to return to its starting point? All right, so it's thrown straight up and returns to its starting point. Therefore, the most important thing to remember is that the total displacement is zero. Whenever an object returns to its starting point, the total displacement is zero. So which means we know the initial speed, we know that the displacement is, the total displacement again is zero. We know the acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.8 meter per second squared. So we can find the time using the equation b naught t plus one half a t squared is equal to y. And plug in that and calculate. The t and the square get cancelled and then 36 by 4.9 gives 7.3 seconds. In number 19, we asked to find the number of significant figures and that is always a good idea to put any number in the scientific notation. So the number is 0 0.003010 which is 3.010 times 10 to the negative three, which means there are four significant figures. That is the easiest way to figure out how many significant figures are there. Which brings us to the last question, where a car travels at 15 meters per second for 10 seconds, then it speeds up with a constant acceleration of two meter per second squared for 15 seconds, at the end of this time, what is its velocity? All right, we have the initial velocity here, which is 15 meter per second. We have the, we have to find the final velocity. The acceleration is 2.0 meter per second squared and the time is 15 seconds. So the equation is Vf is equal to V naught plus AT. And that gives 15 plus uh, two times 15, which, calculation shows is 45 meter per second so that's how you do that question i hope this has been useful for all of you and uh, let me know and uh, post your comments and if you like the youtube video please go ahead and like it and let your friends know so, because it will really help them out to get good grades in physics and thank you